Our next speaker, I wish that in fact the National Lawyers Guild had a frequent flyer bank for all of the miles that Mary Wong has, because then we could do our next Law of the Commons in Paris and all of you would be invited to fly on our, on our dime. The real, the real chore here was catching up with Professor Wong because between her, her functions uh, teaching at Franklin Pierce uh, University School of Law on the East Coast, uh, my sense is that you were sort of circumnavigating the globe many times each week uh, as you were moving between Brussels and Singapore. Um, as I said, I'm not going to go through the CVs of every speaker, just to let you know that our next speaker dealing with information technology systems basically has been in the private sector of Morris and Foster and has been in all the international systems uh, from the Far East to the Far West and to Europe. Mary Wong, you're on. Hi, good morning everybody. Um, my response to Stephen is, um, what else are you going to do in the winter time in New Hampshire where I live? <laughs> Um, Stephen's quite right. I've been in the private sector in practice as an intellectual property lawyer. I'm now in academia as a law professor. Um, and my particular area of interest is international, international intellectual property. Kind of hard to say that at about nine in the morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and when I first got the topic from Stephen, I looked at it briefly and I said, oh, that sounds really cool. And then I didn't really think about it until the time came to prepare for this conference. And then I looked at the names and CVs of all the other speakers. I looked at the write-up and the themes, and then I got terrified. <laughs> I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you to the NLG Seattle, Seattle University, all of you. And I'm really honored to be am amongst a panel of such distinguished and experienced speakers. So anyway, I had to do something. And um, I should first of all say that despite my travels and despite my few experiences in different parts of the globe, I am not a technologist. I can't write a computer program or read an algorithm to save my life. Um, I'm not a philosopher, although I would very much have liked to have been. Um, I'm a lawyer and a teacher. So following the footsteps of um, Lewis and uh, <coughs> excuse me, Stephen, I thought I would tell a sort of story. And this is the story of intellectual property with a focus on the property part of it. And hopefully that will follow from what Lewis said this morning and leading us into the 21st century and the information era. I think that will be built upon by subsequent speakers such as Evan Moglen and the Digital Commons panel later on in the day. And I just realized that I actually did have a series of slides because now the problem is how do I work them? Okay, so having just told you that um, this is not actually going to be the topic of my talk, although I'll return to the we um, at the end of this talk if I may. So like I said, the story I'm going to tell is one of IP, but specifically, um, and partly because a lot of my recent work has been on this, I'd like to focus it on the story of copyright. and. Um, I will not bore you with many stories of law or copyright. I actually think the story of farming is way more interesting. Um, and some of the features that I'll be speaking on is probably familiar to most, if not all of you. I think many of us in this room will agree that throughout copyright's history, which has been around for a couple of hundred, 300 years or so, it's been a story of expansion. And I say that not with anything vested in the process. I'm not saying it's good, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm simply saying that it happened. In the United States, for example, the first Copyright Act of 1790 granted protection to maps, charts, and books for 14 years, which was renewable for another 14, maximum 28. As you know, over time, both the scope and the duration of copyright protection, and this is true for the other intellectual property rights as well to some degree, but with respect to scope and duration for copyright, over time that changed dramatically. So that by 1909, the protection in terms of length was 28, renewable for another 28, maximum 56. And as the 20th century progressed, new technology came into play, 
And so from maps, charts, and books, drawings, sculptures, and so on, the 20th century saw copyright protection extended to things like films, audio recordings, computer programs, and other models of modern technology. Now, I use that as an example because that grounds it for us here in the United States. But the story is true elsewhere. Um, the mother of all treaties for copyright law is the Berne Convention of 1886, um, which was actually signed by something like just over half a dozen countries, mostly European. The United States joined the Berne Convention almost 100 years later, and by now the Berne Union is comprised of many, many more countries than the original half dozen or so. The reason why I mention it, a couple of reasons. Under the Berne Convention, protection, for example, for most works was life plus 50 years. For some works, such as photographs, it was a minimum of 25. For some other works that are now protected by copyright, like films, performances, sound recordings, they weren't mentioned because they didn't exist in 1886. What the treaties in this area, whether copyright, trademarks, patents, or so forth, what they do is they set forth a number of minimum standards. So that if your country joins that particular treaty, in this case the Berne Convention, what you have to do is make sure that your country's laws comply with at least the minimum standards. But it also means that you can go above and beyond. And we call that Berne Plus. Now, as many of you know, what happened in the 20th century with intellectual property was that it stopped being as esoteric and as isolated as it used to be because it became perceived as a very important commercial asset and as a very important tool of international trade. So in 1994, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, was born out of the GATT round of negotiations, and as part of the WTO series of agreements, there was an agreement specific to intellectual property called the Trade Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights, which mercifully has been shortened to TRIPS. What TRIPS did for copyright was that it actually made the burn standards, the TRIPS standards, such that any country that is a member of the WTO and we're talking today about over 180 countries, for their national copyright laws have to implement at least the Berne standards, meaning now the TRIPS standards, meaning that if they go Berne Plus, they can also go TRIPS Plus. So in essence, what we've seen is two things. First, like I said, a historical expansion of copyright law and other intellectual property rights. And secondly, an interna internationalization of the norms and the standards that are applied to intellectual property. If we look at copyright specifically, right, leaving that context and that background aside, you often hear it said and you read about it that copyright is the result of a balancing exercise. In that when you give copyright protection, you are giving exclusive rights meaning the right to exclude others from using that thing, you're giving exclusive rights to a particular person or entity, usually, but not always, the creator. And we do that, and in this country, this particular view is uh, pretty resonant. We do that because the exclusive rights, which are given in the form of private property, is seen as a necessary means. It is seen as the instrument by which to incentivize people to create and to innovate. So it's a set of incentives given by a legal regime to encourage the generation of knowledge for the ultimate purpose that such knowledge, such innovation will contribute to societal development, will be good for progress, and will enable access to knowledge on the part of the general public. So in a way, it's a quid pro quo. If you want to create something, and you do, we give you legal rights. In exchange, after a certain number of years, your creation goes into the public domain and becomes part of the public store of knowledge. 
That's the bargain, that's the balance. Maybe that sounds okay. But what happened in the 20th century, or rather the 19th going into the 20th century, and this is partly fueled by the Industrial Revolution, is that the story became one of almost exclusive focus of, on private property. Because when we talk about giving people a set of exclusive rights, the right to exclude, that starts to look awfully like the right to fence in your own land. The right to exclude people from coming onto your property subject to certain exceptions and limitations. Such was true for copyright as well. And the view of copyright law that proliferated from this basis, that copyright is a form of intellectual property, that in its exclusive rights, it is a form of private property, that that became the raison d'etre, if you like, of a creator, of the copyright owner. And it was subject only to certain limited exceptions and restrictions. I've heard um, writers, I've read authors describe the general scheme of protection under the current US copyright regime as a general set of exclusive rights, very broad, subject to very specific exceptions and limitations. If that is true, then we still have that balance in the sense that we have property rights, private rights on one side, exceptions such as fair use on the other side that allow the public to access and to use the property. But that balance is skewed if it is overly weighed in favor of the private property owner, and less so in favor, let's say, of fair use. So that was the situation, and people have been talking about it for a long time, but the urgency I think of this discussion really was brought about because of the challenges of digital technology and the internet. And this question is not new to anybody here, I don't think. Right? If you think about drawings, you think about maps, books, computer programs, songs, movies, plays, uh, television shows, all the myriad types of creations that are subject to this private property right we call copyright. The question is, well, how do we deal with new forms of creativity? How do we deal, for example, with remixing and user-generated content, which depends for its creativity on the ability to access, the ability to copy, the ability to take, to manipulate existing work that may be protected by copyright? If the copyright regime does not allow any of this kind of new user creativity, creativity that's enabled, facilitated, and even encouraged by new technology such as the internet and its open architecture, then what is copyright law doing? If fair use can only go so far, how far should it go? So the balancing exercise that we keep talking about in copyright law that we've talked about from the beginning continues to be something that preoccupies the minds of copyright policy makers and legislators, not just in the US, but elsewhere as well. And so for purposes of this particular discussion, but also a discussion that started to pick up pace amongst a bunch of IP scholars, the question is whether we can use the concept of a commons to assist us in rebalancing, recalibrating copyright law for the digital age. Either we say that copyright law is not actually private property and is a free-for-all, and that's possibly an attractive idea to some, or we say that we can't stem the tide, we can't change history, that there is some benefit, whether economic or more general than that, to having some form of private property in what you create. The question is, what are the limits? At what point should we allow others to access and use what you've created to fuel further innovation to add to the general store of knowledge? And I think that, like I said, the discussion has been um, injected with a sense of urgency because of digital technology. With that, with some of the new user creativity that I've talked about, with what the internet has enabled us to do in terms of creation, communication, and distribution, I think there's one more thing that we need to look at and to pay attention to.
And perhaps some of the other speakers will, ex will expound on this a little more. Um, I'm hardly an expert in the area. But you cannot go near any digital copyright or modern IP literature that tries to look at this balancing exercise in the information age without realizing that there has been an emergence of new social norms that are brought by this type of technology and the internet. And I put here on the slide some of the adjectives and some of the categorizations that I think are familiar to everybody um, and the activities as well. And I'll just point out two things. One is with respect to the collaborative characteristics it starts to look very much like some of the benefits and some of the arguments for a commons. Second, with respect to the activities, what is happening is that with respect to modern day consumers and users of copyrighted content, whether of software or of, you know, the old fashioned book, we are no longer content to be passive. We want to be engaged. We are active users. We want to participate and we want to join online communities to remix, to mash up, to manipulate, and to change existing content. So like I said, the question is, this is what's happening. Where is the balance to be struck in copyright law? There is now a strain of scholarship, and I'm, I hope, and maybe Maggie can correct me if I'm wrong, attention being paid um, by those more important than myself, to things that copyright law should be thinking about beyond just merely economics, beyond merely how do we get somebody to create something that will be of use to society? Oh, let's give him a private property right, because then he can make money. Then he can license, and then he can pay lawyers like what I used to be, to draft up all those horrible contracts, or at least horrible to other people. Um, that's well and good. And as I'll say at the end of my talk, I think there is room for that, there has to be room. As an artist, you need to be able to make a living, but that doesn't mean that others should not be allowed to use your work to some extent. Right? But beyond the economics, beyond the need to make a living, copyright law is about creativity, or rather copyright, the concept of giving somebody encouragement to create something. Something that will be beneficial to societal development and cultural progress, that particular set of public interest values leads us to things like the notion of a democratic discourse, the notion that participation and engagement in a community is something that is not just necessary for self-fulfillment, but necessary for development in a particular community and society. And the fact also, and this is um, known to you if, if you've read the Commons literature, that if someone is engaged and has an interest in the process of management, of use, maybe of our ownership, that participatory engagement, I'm sorry, um, will actually lead to a sense of distributive justice that in some sense you are getting a share in what your society, your community is creating. All these intangible, normative, public interest values tend to be absent or tend to have been absent from the general copyright discourse on the national and international stage. And what some of us have been trying to do is to try and see how these rather more diffuse, perhaps not terribly well understood, but nonetheless fundamentally important social values need to be part of a policy-making process that is about knowledge, that is about access to information, that is about societal development. The problem I have with using the comments, and I might as well jump straight to it, and it's kind of on the next slide, um, is that, and perhaps this is just my own lack of understanding, is that there is no, to my mind, single, universal, accepted meaning of the commons. Lewis alluded at this morning when you talked about the meanings of the commons. And when you talked about too common or commoning, um, as what Peter has written about, as a force of social order. I'd like to leave that aside for a moment and try and come back to it at the end. But if we talk about the commons aside from that meaning, we talk about the commons as a property concept. There is no single 
accepted meaning, and there seems to be misunderstandings, even among scholars about what they're talking about. And I hope none of them are in the room. <laughs> That's one thing. But the second thing is, when we talk about the information age, like I said, the creativity, the user participation, and the emergence of movements such as open access publishing, creative commons licensing, and so forth, um, there has been a strain of scholarship and of nomenclature that has developed around what has been labeled the information commons, or even the information semi-commons. And I think that's really interesting, that's really useful, it is part of the discourse, but I don't know that we can really go any further with either the commons as a general concept or any of these specific information-based commons concepts if we don't understand what it means. And here is kind of my summary. On the previous slide, you may have noticed that I've talked about the distinction between public property, common property, and private property. What these have in common, sorry, no pun intended, is that it doesn't mean that there is no legal owner. I, we, I know we've gone back to feudal times, medieval times, we've gone back to the story of homesteading, and I was very tempted to take us back to Roman times and Roman law, but fortunately, in the interest of time, I can't. Uh, but the point is that under ancient concepts of law, there was some property that humans couldn't own because it was owned by some higher being. But with respect to human-owned property, there were different types. The state could own some, the public as a whole could own some, specific communities could own some, and a single private owner could also own some. And even with respect to the single private owner, Certain norms developed, particularly in England, where part of his land had to be open to his fellow neighbors so that they could pasture, so that they could get water, and so forth. My point here is that when we talk about the commons, we sometimes tend not to be specific as to what type of ownership we mean which may not matter as much because I don't think the ownership portion matters. I don't think it really matters who owns it at a fairly holistic level. I think what matters is who has the right to access and to use that property, whether it's owned by one person, a group, the state, or the general public. I don't want to talk about the public domain in it because that's a specific part of copyright discourse, even though I put it on the slide because I think I'm running out of time. But my point here is that we need to make a distinction. When we use terms, when we use legal concepts like the commons, a distinction between ownership and access. And I suggest that we're going to use the commons as a substantive concept to assist us in recalibrating copyright and intellectual property law going forward, that we focus on the access portion and not ownership. Another way that we can look at the commons is, rather than borrow the concept and say, well, let's look at what uh, innovation is, let's look at what copyright is and map it to what we know of the commons, why don't we just use the commons as rhetoric? Why don't we just use the rich scholarship, the rich language that has developed around the notion of the commons, from property scholars, to anthropologists, to all manner of social scientists, particularly the ones that work on what we call common pool resources, and use that, returning to the commoning notion, to marshal a force of social order. Because the social norms that I've talked about in this information age, the active rather than the passive user, the engaged manipulator of content rather than the mere consumer, means that there is developing, and lawyers and policymakers need to understand this, there is a gulf, in fact, in reality, between the legal notion of this is my property, don't touch or I'll sue you, and yes, this may be your property, but I'm gonna use it anyway. So how do we deal with that reality? And we see that reality in practice in a number of movements and in a number of day-to-day -day activities including the multiple uploads to YouTube, 
I don't know how many remixes of the Star Wars kid we want to watch, but I've watched quite a number. And I think they're all cool, right? But if copyright law is basically going to say, well, you can't do any of this without asking the permission of George Lucas, then we are stifling creativity. And a lot of the people who are making the remixes, the mashups, and posting these cool videos do not understand or do not wish to understand why the law is stopping them from creating such great new content that the original owner would possibly never have created. So can we use this notion that we are all in this together, that there is a social order that is changing here? that the notion of sharing our content, whether through free and open source software or through the remix videos, by collaborating with others, posting it openly so others can comment, can remix, can upload, can distribute, that not only is that a force for good, but that is the kind of democratic discourse, that is the kind of self-participation and fulfillment that we want to encourage in modern society and that copyright law should deal with. I hope that we can. I don't know that we have yet. Um, hopefully, those few of us that are working in this area are not just lonely voices in the wilderness. And for that, I will recruit everybody in the audience right, and everyone you know, and so we can actually prove the network effects argument, um, which would be great. Um, I don't want to conclude entirely on a uncertain or a pessimistic note. I will mention that in the copyright arena, coming back to the original focus of my um, talk, that in the international policy arena, there are a couple of things happening that I suggest we all pay attention to. And that I suggest, if you are interested, and copyright is not necessarily this arcane technical area. It can't be, because I'm doing it, so it's not rocket science. Um, but because if you accept, as I do, that copyright law is not just about allowing artists or creators the right to control their content through private property in order to make a living, but that also that should coexist, not trample upon the rights of others to learn from that and to use some of what's been created because as we all know, we see further by standing on the shoulders of giants. In the international copyright arena, how this has transpired into policy discussions has been through at least two initiatives, and I'll mention them very quickly. One is the adoption, about a year and a half ago, of something called the WIPO Development Agenda, the World Intellectual Property Organization that administers uh, all the IP treaties. Um, basically adopted a obvious and clearly stated mandate that development concerns, meaning assisting the developing world to gain access to knowledge through the internet, through education resources and so forth, to alleviate poverty, to assist in getting infrastructure out there. That form of development has to form a very substantial basis for policy making going forward. At the moment, we don't quite know how far that commitment's going to go, because as you know, when you deal with international organizations and multiple governments, there's a lot of things that kind of get in the way of actually getting things done. But it's encouraging that there has been a commitment on the international stage that development concerns that involve access to knowledge have to be at the table. The second development, which for lawyers may be actually almost more exciting because it's somewhat more specific, is the start of a movement on the part of some member countries of WIPO to initiate discussions on a new treaty, not the Berne Convention, which is useful, you know, um, and it does give us the basis for private property rights, to start talking about the role of the exceptions to intellectual property rights, the role of the exceptions to copyright. So for example, how far should fair use stretch when it comes to access to educational resources for a developing country, should there be perhaps a different, a broader, a mandatory exception 
Again, the work there is rather preliminary, but those are two things that I think are worthwhile keeping an eye on, whether you're a consumer protection advocate, an educator, or someone who cares about access to knowledge. And on that note, I hope to leave you with much food for thought, and I will be happy to take questions. Yes, I was wondering where voting machine <coughs> software fell into this uh, genre. Are you referring to a specific instance or case? <laughs> well, whether it was open source and if it fell into that same yeah. category or not, that would be sacred as far as I saw it. But the proprietary nature of it uh, seems to keep the public from accessing it. So. Right. Um, and I'll just give a quick response to that, and I'd like to make two comments. I think, first of all, with respect to the voting machine incident or example, um, you're right, if, if the interface, if the operations were more open, then I think that would not only allow for perhaps a greater stability or robustness in the operation and therefore the safety of such systems, but it would probably also inspire voter and therefore public confidence if you had open standards for that kind of thing, or indeed anything that is clearly in the public interest. So that's one specific response. Um, the other response or the comment that I'd like to make is a little bit more general, uh, but you know, it's a little more specific. Um, it depends on your point of view as is all these things. Um, and it is that in the United States, for example, one particular slight development, I think, but I think it might gain in notoriety perhaps or usage is this notion of copyright misuse on the part of a copyright owner and for a long time I was kind of the sleeper you know every time somebody used someone's copyright work without permission the big defense that everybody jumped on was fair use uh, but what the one case about the voting machines in the United States showed is and a couple of other cases involving literary estates and so forth have shown us is that there is this doctrine kicking around in the sort of back story of copyright, co copyright misuse, which the courts in this country have started to show a willingness to take a look at, to say to a copyright owner, you know what, you may have the exclusive rights, you are the owner, you have the private property, but there is an equitable doctrine that says if you misuse that, in other words, if you go beyond what the law has given you and you threaten others, um, without legal basis by saying that what they're doing is not fair use, for example, um, then we will use that doctrine to prevent you from over-asserting your property rights. So on those two comments, I think, again, there are possibly developments judicially and hopefully on the standard side as well. <laughs>